Good morning. Good morning. Oh. I'm skipping John this morning and I'm jumping over to Isaiah. Uh, I like Isaiah. And there's some really interesting things in Isaiah that we can look at. And Isaiah chapter 40 is the one thing I'm going to be looking at. So if you want to turn there, that's what this is all about, is Isaiah. And I just got to check because I didn't think. Eh, I guess it's recording. Oh, well. Vision. Without action is merely a dream. Action without vision, you're just passing the time. Vision with action can change the world. And that's what we need to understand. You've got to learn to catch a vision. And I think that the greatest gift of God that God ever gave man is not the gift of sight, but it's the gift of vision. Sight is just a function of the eyes, but vision is it's a function of your heart. And you need to learn to have vision. Vision is the art of seeing what is what is invisible. It's the art of seeing what is invisible to others. Because others, they don't if they don't have a vision, they can't see. And Jesus is dealing with that in John chapter 9, or he's making that comment in John chapter 9, right at the end with verse uh, 39. Because in John chapter 9, he was dealing with the, uh, the, the man that was born blind, and he gave him vision, and the Jews were just all over his case. And right at the end of that chapter, Jesus says, For judgment I came into this world, so that those who do not see may see, and that those who may see, who see, may become blind. He's talking about vision, right? Those of the Pharisees who were with him heard him say these things and said, We're not blind too, are we? If you were blind, you would have no sin. But since you say we see, your sin remains. This is what Isaiah is, is going to get, trying to get us to think about, or at least it's it's God who wrote Isaiah, is trying to get us to think about, you know, it, it's to have a vision. And it's Isaiah right at the very end. It's It's a wonderful section. And I've always wanted to do one because I love eagles and, and, We'll talk about those eagles. He gives strength to the weary, verse 29. And to him who lacks might, oh, I don't want 29. I think I want 28. Do you not know, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the earth, the creator of the ends of the earth does not become weary or tired. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives strength to the weary. And to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though you, though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble blind badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and never get tired. They will walk and not become weary. That's the, the vision that he's trying to get us to have. And you've got to capture this vision. And he's talking, New Testament is what he's talking. Isaiah is a really cool book because it's got 66 chapters. And the first 39, just like the just like the Bible's got the 66 books. And the first 39 of the Old Testament, the first 39 of Isaiah is physical stuff. And from chapter 40, the last 27, the last 27 uh, chapters in Isaiah are like the 27 New Testament books. It's all spiritual. It's all talking about when the Messiah comes. And it's it's futuristic. You gotta have, you gotta learn to catch vision. You gotta be able to see more than what you, you can hear is what you need to hear. He says right there in 28, do you not know? This is so cool. Have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth? Who is he talking about? Well, he's not talking about the father. He's talking about the son. He's talking about Christ. Isaiah chapter nine, verse six. Isaiah chapter nine is such a brilliant bit of text. But just from verse six alone, a child will be born to us. Obviously, Jesus. A son will be given to us and the government will, I'm sorry, the government will rest on his shoulders and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Those are the names of Christ, the everlasting God, the Lord. And he's not only him, but he's also the creator of the ends of the earth. 
Yeah, so many people like to destroy the Trinity, and and you know, and you just go, wait a second, Christ is accepting worship. He knows he's God, and he is the Creator. People think that Jesus just all of a sudden showed up, you know, but he didn't. He's always been with us. Colossians chapter one, verse fifteen to seventeen. He. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. If you saw Jesus, you saw God, not in the physical, but in everything that Jesus does, this is what God the Father would do, the very same thing. For by him, all things, by Christ, all things were created in the heavens and on earth, visible, invisible, thrones or dominions, rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things. In him, all things hold together. So, so Isaiah is right off the bat introducing us to the everlasting God, Christ. And he does not become weary or tired. You need to remember in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, Jesus said after the resurrection, because Jesus emptied himself, Philippians chapter two, to become a man so he could die. God can't die. But he emptied himself to become a man so he could die on the cross so our sins would be forgiven. But after that, the resurrection, then he says, what? All authority has been given to me, you know, in heaven and on earth. He's been reinstated. He now has all his godly attributes. He was always God when he was with us. He just didn't have any of those godly attributes. But now he is. He never becomes weary or tired. His understanding... Ah, you know, you have to smile at people who are so dumb. I'd say other words, but I'll just say dumb. When they laugh at the Bible and, and put it on a shelf, you know, with all the other religious writings. Because the Bible is so far above absolutely everything. It's the number one bestseller. It's been the number one bestsellers. That's why you never see it as the number one bestseller on top of the list. Because it's, it's like hundreds the thousands of books more than anything in, any man has ever written every year we still sell more bibles in this world than any other book and it is so rich it's brilliant and all i want to read here is what ephesians chapter 3 14 for this reason i bow my knees before the father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened Paul's praying that you be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. If you're a Christian, you've got the Holy Spirit in the inner man so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to what? Comprehend with all the saints. It's not just a priesthood. No, with all the saints, you can comprehend what is the breadth, length, height, and depth. And to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God, to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond, far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or, or even think, according to the power that works where? Within us. The power that works within us. It's the word of God with the Holy Spirit. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. That's such a powerful statement that you've got the power, you, you've been empowered, you've got access to the most incredible communication. Men are so much into exploring all these other different worlds, right? And they waste so much time because they don't get into the word of God. Everything else is going to be destroyed. Everything physical is gone. So you can go to the greatest depths, but if you do not find God in your life, what a waste. Truly, what a waste. He gives strength to the weary. Now, th this strength to the weary is, is, you've all been there. If you're a Christian, you had to have been there because you're just tired of this world. This world just doesn't have, I ran down enough roads. I wasn't blessed to be like Solomon. He could do all, just read Ecclesiastes and at the end of it all, follow God. Keep his commandments. Fear God. Keep his commandments. Thank you, James. Yes. That's what we need to understand. Uh, where, where am I looking for? I'm looking for Titus chapter 3, verse 5 through verse 7. He saved us. Not 
on the basis of deeds which we have done. You can't earn enough. There's not. There's no way. Our good deeds, our works are like filthy rags that we've done in righteousness. But according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration, the washing of regenesis, by your baptism, and see, we, we so mess up in so many ways because we seem to get hung up on this thing called baptism. Yes, you have to be baptized for forgiveness of sins, but we always drop to receive the Holy Spirit. Because if you don't get baptized, there's no Holy Spirit. But if you don't get the Holy Spirit, because he says the washing of regeneration and what? The renewing by the Holy Spirit. Now the Spirit lives within. Now you're being renewed day by day. The old man, you've got to have an understanding of the Spirit. You've got to work with God so that he can what? Work with you. It just doesn't happen. If you don't apply yourself, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified justified by his grace, we would be made heirs, heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Yeah. He gives strength to the weary. But now you're empowered because you're a Christian. His strength to the weary and to the one who lacks might, he increases power. He increases your power. Romans chapter one, verse 16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's what? It's the power of God. You want to get empowered? You want to get richer or mightier? You get into the word of God. There's where the power comes from. James chapter one, verse five. If you lack wisdom, if you don't understand what that text saying, what? Pray to God and God will give you freely. God loves to. He loves it when his children I mean, if you're a parent, you love it when your child comes to you and asks you for what? Help. Oh, now you're ready to listen to me. It's about time. You know, okay, God, does, I'm like that, but God's not like that, right? But if you ask him for help, that's what he wants to do. Because if he helps us, now we can help others. Ah, that's how it works. Totally. Right? And John's... I've got John 16, 13 to 15, and I'm kind of puzzled because my brain's not really functioning very well today. But J John 16, 13 to 15, when he, the spirit of truth comes, will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of mine, disclose it to you. All things that father has are mine, and therefore I said he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. And there's the through the Holy Spirit, through praying to God, through the Holy Spirit, He increases our power, which makes us mightier. I think there's some place where it talks about He was mighty. Wasn't that Apollos? He was mighty in the scriptures, right? Yeah. That's what God wants us to do to get into that relationship, to listen to hear Him talk, understand what He's truly trying to say, and then become a voice for Him in the world around us. Though use, 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 use sounds like sheep or something. I don't know. Use, youth. Hey, you know what I'm saying? Grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly. It doesn't matter how strong you are. Muscles don't cut it. Physical things don't cut it, right? Because if you're relying on your own personal strength, you're going to get wearied and tired, and you're going to stumble. If you're tired at the end of the day, you don't have God working with you. You got to be working with God. You got to take God with you. The worldly rely on their own strength. That's why they grow weary and, and they get tired. What does Jesus say about your own strength? John chapter 15, verse 5. Without me, you can't do anything. With me, watch what you can accomplish. Watch what you can accomplish. Yet, those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. Oh, I love that word new. But those who wait for the Lord, that's the question you need to ask yourself. Because we live in this society of immediate gratification. Can you wait for the Lord? Right? That's what Titus is trying to get through to us in, ch in chapter 11. 2 verse 11 through verse 14 where he says the grace of god has appeared christ bringing salvation all men 
instructing us to deny ungodliness, worldly desires, live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for, that's what waiting's all about, looking for the blessed hope and appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed, every lawless deed, there is no sin that he cannot forgive you from, and to purify for himself a people for his own possession. We are slaves, we belong to God, and we need to be what? Zealous for good deeds. But you've got to be what? Looking for the blessed hope, looking for the fact that Jesus, and if I'm looking for, I need to be like the virgins, the five wise virgins in Matthew chapter 25, who took the extra oil, who kept studying the scriptures, who were preparing themselves, because you never know when the bridegroom is coming, right? You've always got to have that faith growing inside of you. Second Peter chapter 3, and I'm just into a lot of verses here, but I just love these verses. The day of the Lord, verse 10, will come like a thief. So you don't know when Jesus comes again. There's no thousand years that we're going to fall into. We're living in the thousand years. Because the warning here coming from Peter is the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with the roar, elements destroyed, intense heat, earth works burned up. Since all these things are be destroyed what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? That's the kind of people you need to be. And you need to be what? Looking for, hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed and burning and the elements will melt with intense fire. How do you hasten the coming of the day of the Lord? Well, if you believe that the names are written in the book of life, that there's going to be an end of the book of life, how do you hasten for the end? Well, you just get out there and you try to teach people to become Christians, get their books, their names written in the book, right? And so all those names that are going to be written in the book, when the book is finally finished, God's coming. Because he knows who's going to be saved. So you need to get out and do the work we're supposed to do. Help save lost souls. And that'll speed up the coming of the Lord, right? Don't sit back and worry about it is what you need to. You have to be always waiting. The question you have to ask is, am I waiting? And not only am I waiting, am I ready? Am I ready for the day that he shows? Because he's going to show and you're not going to, you know, you're not going to know anything. But those who wait, if you stay focused on God, you continue in your studies, you continue trying to share the word, those who wait, he makes this promise, you'll gain new strength. New strength. Not that which, you know, that the Jews are talking about, new strength. And I think you get it from John chapter 1, verse 17. The law is given through Moses, but what? Grace and truth are realized through Jesus Christ. We have the Old Testament. Jesus came to open up the understanding of the Old Testament, to have that vision of understanding. That's that new strength. That's that John chapter 7, verse 38 and verse 39. When he says, he who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. He spoke of the spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive for the spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. He's got to die on the cross. He's glorified on the cross. So he sheds his blood. So then when he ascends into heaven, he can now send the Holy Spirit who dwells in each and every one of his children. And through the Holy Spirit, as we said before, you get this new strength to do what? Ah, Isaiah chapter 58. And if you're dealing with a friend who's in a denomination, they have this horrible method of interpreting the scriptures physically. They have no vision to see the spiritual lessons because they have no Holy Spirit because they haven't been baptized for forgiveness of their sins and to receive the Holy Spirit. So they they, they stumble when they come to, oh, the, there's that stumbling, right? Stumble badly is what they do. And in, in 58, 12, those from among you talking about Christians will rebuild the ancient ruins. You will raise up the age old foundations. You, you Christians will be called repair of the breach 
restorer of the streets to which you dwell. He's not talking physical. He's talking spiritual. What are those ancient things? Well, he mentions it again someplace over in uh, chapter 60. No, 61. Where are you going? Christ in Nazareth. The spirit of God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, freedom to the prisoners, proclaim a fa the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance. I think that day of vengeance is 70 AD. To comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a spirit of fainting. So they will be called oaks of the righteous, or oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. He's talking about coming to establish his church, to establish the truth so that his people will be strong and bold and courageous. Then... Verse four, they will rebuild the ancient ruins. They will raise up the former devastations. They will repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. What's he talking about? To me, he's talking about Old Testament understanding, New Testament understanding. The churches of, the, of, of Asia, the seven churches of Asia are not there. They've been destroyed. Churches come, churches go. The church of Christ, the kingdom stays. But churches will drift away from the truth and they'll get into something foolish. We, the, the Christians of this era, need to get back into the word of God and dig it up and have a true understanding. Rebuild the ruins. You're either rebuilding the ruins or you're becoming one. And you don't want to become one. You want to be into the rebuilding. We've got to get back into the text and start saying, well, this is what God is saying. And he's speaking to the church. He's not speaking to a thousand years from now, you know. He's speaking today to us. We have to have our ears so we can be, we'll have that new strength so we can do the work he's called us to do, to rebuild the ancient ruins so people can find their way back to God. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry. That this is that was the warm-up. Okay. <laughs> now. This, this part is so cool. So cool. Revelation chapter 12, verse 14. Write this one down. They will mount up with wings like eagles. Ah, yeah, you gotta you gotta have a concordance, because if you got a concordance at home, you'll look up that word eagles and it sends you to what? Revelation chapter 12, verse 14. Right? They will mount up like eagles, they will soar like eagles. How do you get up to be there? And I've never seen this. Like, this is cool. I got to change my revelation notes. The two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman so that she could fly into the wilderness to her place where she was nourished for a time's time and a half a time from the presence of the serpent. That's clear as mud, right? Yeah, wonderful. What's he talking about? Well, the woman is the church. He's talking about the Roman persecution. The wilderness, well, I believe the wilderness was where the seven churches of Asia were because she, the church had to flee Jerusalem when 70 AD was destroyed, where she was nourished and she'll be nourished for a time's time and a half the time, which the three and a half simply represents the persecution of the guys, the Romans, from the presence of the serpent. But I missed the most important part, and I always miss the most important part. I'm good at that because we like to read right past the two wings of the great eagle were given to her. What is that? There is a great eagle in Ezekiel chapter 17 talking about, I think God in, in doing the, the work that he was doing possibly, or maybe he's more talking about Babylon because he says a great eagle, but who's the great eagle? right? Has to be God. And the woman, the church is given what? The two wings. What are the two wings that were given that we will be nourished by these two wings, right? John chapter, who did that? Was it all or was it Theo? John chapter three, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave 
What's that? Wing number one. He gave us his son. But then, where, where, where do I need to go? I need to go to John chapter 14, verse 26. Well, uh, John chapter 14, verse 14, 14, verse 16 and 26. Those are two very important ones. But look, look what Jesus is saying in John chapter 14, verse 16. I will ask the Father and he will what? Give you another helper that he may be with you forever. And in 26, but the helper, let's identify him, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you these things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Well, it's interesting that Jesus says, wherever two or more are gathered together, I'm with you. What are the two wings of the great eagle? It's Jesus and it's the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit, but you can enter into the presence of God, two or more gathered together, and he's nourishing us with his word. That's the two wings. They will mount up with wings like eagles. You can't fly. Without me, you can do nothing. Without me, you can't get off the ground. But you need both me and the Holy Spirit is what Christ is saying. And you can mount up with wings like eagles. Run and never get tired. Oh, I was kind of talking about the with, with the guys in my, in my class this morning. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 8 to 11. You, you run and never get tired because you're not doing it physically. You're doing it spiritually. He says, if Joshua had given them rest, he would have not spoken of another day after that. There remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from, from his. God rested from his works when? On the seventh day. And he quit what? Creating. He quit what? He cre quit doing the physical so that he focused only on the spiritual. Now he's trying to figure out how I can save mankind because he just sinned in my garden. And I have to bring him along so that he'll, the time is right when he brought his son into the world. But they're not going to be able to do it with only Christ. They need the Holy Spirit. God has all of this. When you learn to give up doing the physical and get into the spiritual is when you start to get into God's rest. So take God with you to work. Take God with you whenever you're studying. Pray when? All the time. If you're praying all the time, the stress is on God. Let him worry about that. Let him take care of that. You're just trying to be that person of God that you need to be. Oh, there was another verse and I meant to add it. And I don't think I added it, but I'm going to add it real quick here. And that's Ephesians, Ephesians chapter six. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters, according to the flesh with fear and trembling. But with good will, render service as to the Lord, not to men. You don't work for men. They may think you're, the, you're their slave, you know, but you're not. You're God's slave. And so in everything that you do, you do heartily for the Lord and people will look at you and they'll wonder why you're working so hard. Why do you always want to do a good job? Why do you give 100%? You know, you got people at work that say they don't pay me enough. Right? Well, listen, they pay you to do your eight hours. Quit after your eight hours and go do your family life. Don't be a North American and think you have to work for 24 hours. Right. But those eight hours, give them 100 percent and then give your family the other 100 percent when you get home. Right. We got to watch what we're doing here, but they will mount up with e like eagles. Ephesians chapter two, verse six. What's he what's he say as far as mounting up like eagles? God has raised us up with him. God has raised us up with Christ, seated us with him in the heavenly places. Colossians chapter Oh, I think there's a few in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. When you've been baptized, he rescued you from the domain of darkness, transferred you into the kingdom of his beloved son, the kingdom, which is where? In heaven, right? Chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. 
states, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were raised up with him, Jesus is in heaven, through faith in the working of God who raised him, when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you what? Alive. You died, but now you're alive with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. Listen to what he's saying in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. If you've been raised up with Christ, because you died to yourself, you're raised, you're that new creature. If you've been raised with Christ, keep seeking the things where? Above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things where? Above, not, not on the things that are on the earth. Because you've died, your life is hidden with Christ in God. Why do we why, why do we act like chickens and we walk around pecking in the dirt when we're eagles and we should be sh soaring up on high? I don't know. That's a good question that I need to ask myself. Because I'm always trying to get Hebrews 12, 22 in my, my heart. It's got to always be there. You've come to Mount Zion, city of living God, heavenly Jerusalem, myriads of angels, festal assembly, church of the firstborn, enrolled in heaven, God, the judge of all, spirits of the righteous made perfect. Since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, what do we need to do? Lay aside every encumbrance and sin which so easily entangles us and run with race. One run with endurance the race set before us. Quit scratching. Get into the rest of God. Get into that spiritual. But you've always got to encourage yourself every day. You've got to catch the vis vision and you've got to work on the vision. Visions quickly evaporate unless you start working on it and continue to what? Read the scriptures and, and get this down. Memorize some scriptures or at least where they are, that will encourage you. Because this is the vision that God's trying to get through to us. They will walk in what? Never become weary. Philippians chapter 1, verse 23 says what? I'm hard pressed from both directions, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, because that's better. Yet to remain on in the flesh more necessary for you. Paul's saying what? I'd rather die and be with Christ right now because that's what happens when you die. You go to be with Christ, provided you've been faithful. And it's not hard to be faithful. God has given one, two wings, the Son and the Spirit to help us get there. Philippians chapter 3, 14, what does Paul say? Press on. I press on towards the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Verse 20, our citizenship is where? It's in heaven from which we all, from which we also eagerly wait for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the vision I'm trying to implant. God has, has that vision. You need to see that he has given us the ability to enter that throne room, Romans chapter four and chapter five, anytime you want, not just when you worship, but even more when you're by yourself in your prayer life. When you go to work, you're in the heavenlies and you're looking at the world, not down at people, but you're looking at the world because the world is below us, right? And we're trying to see how we can reach down and help a fellow laborer lift them up into the heavenlies right we're always looking how can i help i don't see myself as superior i see myself as blessed but i need to have the compassion to see how can i whatever i'm doing wherever i am how can i be the person of god that i need to be catch that vision because that's what it's called that's what it's, it that's when you're soaring with the wings of God, which is really cool. Because our destination, it's heaven. Don't let anything down here discourage you. Hang on to that. And that's where we're headed to. And that's the words of encouragement I have for us this morning.